This video is for education and entertainment purposes only. Please consult with your health care provider before making any changes to your health. Hey beautiful soul, editing Jacqueline here. Um, I just wanted to kind of add this clip in and let y'all know about an amazing um, exercise and lichen sclerosis opportunity. So this video is all about exercising with lichen sclerosis. And I talk a lot about um, mindful movement and kind of exercising in a way that feels right for you and your body, i.e. your lichen sclerosis. Um, and so for example, if you are in a flare, that might not be the best time to go on a huge run. When you're in a flare, you might want to step back a bit. But stepping back doesn't mean you have to stop all exercise and all movement. It just might mean that you opt for something that's more gentle, like for example, a restorative yoga practice or maybe a pelvic floor Hatha inspired yoga practice, something like that, where you're a lot more gentle, slow, moving mindfully, but you're still getting some stretch, you're still getting some movement, and you're still getting those stress reducing benefits from your exercise. So many of us with lichen sclerosis, in addition to all of the symptoms that come with lichen sclerosis, we can have pelvic floor pain. We might have hypertonic pelvic floor, which is basically like, you know, our pelvic floor muscles are like hyper tightened, which can cause really unpleasant symptoms such as burning and itch. So that's definitely not helping our kind of LS situation. So in addition to your main treatment plan, it can be nice to have some complementary things in place to really round out that package and, you know, get things as good as they can be. So um, one thing that you can do, like a kind of complementary treatment, would be pelvic floor physical therapy. And I do have a lot of video content centered around that that will be coming out over the next few months. If you are really keen to learn more about that, I do have some blog posts on my website, so I will link those in the description box below for you to check out. And then another complimentary um, piece can be pelvic floor yoga. Um, and then if you wanna like combine forces, you can do um, pelvic floor PT and pelvic floor yoga, put them together for like ultimate success. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a pelvic floor um, health membership that is hosted and run by Penny. So Penny um, is just, oh, she's so incredible. She's so funny. Um, I will have her contact information in the description box. If you're not following her on Instagram, definitely go follow her. Her reels are just hilarity. She's so funny. She's so approachable. She's so warm and she's so kind. She is also a lichen sclerosis warrior. So she also has lichen sclerosis um, and she also lives and suffers with pelvic pain and she happens to be a yoga teacher. So what Penny did was she kind of put all the pieces together and she created a pelvic floor yoga membership for others with lichen sclerosis and various pelvic floor pain issues such as like vaginismus. So she put this together and it's really like a Hatha inspired yoga practices that really focus on relaxing the pelvic floor because again when we have a lot of trauma and issues down there those muscles tend to tighten up which causes a bunch of issues for us downstream so this is great because hatha inspired yoga is really wonderful for reducing our stress which as you probably know stress and lichen sclerosis oof, they don't get along too well um, when we experience stress or high levels of stress that can often kick some folks into a flare or just make symptoms worse. So we definitely want to always mindfully be kind of practicing different stress reduction techniques in our day-to-day -day life to kind of keep that stress at a manageable level. So this can be one way that you can do this. Um, so I've been a part of this membership now for um, some time and I absolutely love the membership. I'm in there pretty often, as often as I possibly can with my busy schedule. And I've definitely noticed a huge 
um, improvement in my pelvic floor. There's less tension, there's more spaciousness. Um, sometimes I like doing some of her um, classes or tutorials before I do my dilators to you know really soften the area and I find that to be super helpful. So um, basically what the, so there's a lot of things in the membership. It's an online membership and what you will have access to is every week Penny does a live 45 minute yoga class and you can join with your camera off. There's no issues there. You know, whatever makes you feel comfortable. I usually have my camera on. Um, I just like seeing people's faces and I think it's nice sometimes to see, you know, some little faces on the screen. Um, so there's that every single week. In addition to that, in the membership, you will find um, like a library of different classes. So there's a section for different meditations that you can do. Love doing those. I try and personally meditate about two to four times a week. Um, more if I can, but you know, it's not always possible. She also has various breathwork classes um, and those, oh my gosh, I love those. The alternate nose breathing is one of my favorites for really calming the nervous system and kind of bringing things back down. Um, there is also a repository of like previous classes that she's taught. So you can always kind of go back if you miss a class, there's no worries. And you also have access to the Facebook community group for the membership, which is a really nice lively space of pelvic pain and LS kind of warriors. And, you know, we can ask questions about, you know, certain yoga poses or product recommendations. It's a really friendly, amazing community that Penny has built. So if you are interested in the pelvic floor yoga membership, I will leave a link in the description box for you to sign up. And if you sign up through that link, you can use my discount code Jacqueline, J-A-C-L-Y-N, um, capital letters. I will have that in the description box. You can use that code and you can get 30% off your first month. So that first month you would pay $25.90 and, $25 and then subsequent months would be $37 per month. So again, I will leave that link as well as my, um, my, my discount code in the description box below so you can check that out. And finally, before I hop off and let you get back to um, this video, uh, I just wanna also say that if you're kind of curious but you're not sure if it's for you yet, please feel free to reach out to me. You can DM me on Instagram or you can email me at Jacqueline, that's J-A-C-L-Y-N, at lostlabia.com. Hey, beautiful soul. It's Jacqueline from the Lost Labia Chronicles, where I discuss all things lichen sclerosis. So if you have lichen sclerosis and are looking to empower yourself with information, find acceptance and reclaim your life, then this is the channel for you. And if you have a friend or family member that have lichen sclerosis and you want to learn more about the physical and mental aspects of lichen sclerosis so that you can better support them in their journey, then please subscribe to this channel and definitely share my videos with them. So in today's video, what I'm going to discuss is lifestyle, um, particularly exercise. So I'm going to address the question of can you exercise with lichen sclerosis? and what you need to know about exercising with lichen sclerosis and I'll kind of give some tips and tricks and uh, obviously discuss some of my lived experience with that. Um, so if that sounds like something you've been wondering about or you're looking for tips to kind of reincorporate exercise back into your life, then this is the video for you. So if you follow my blog, um, which you can read at www.lostlabia/blog. Um, if you've read that, you might have stumbled upon a couple posts that I have on exercise where I kind of talk about my history and my background with exercise and how that kind of intersected with uh, lichen sclerosis and what that meant for me. So I'm going to kind of briefly go over that just kind of as a background um, and we'll kind of build up into addressing the questions. So. Prior to my diagnosis, I was an incredibly active person. Um, I trained at the gym about six times a week. I was a weightlifter. Um, and in addition to doing weightlifting, um, you know, and I lifted heavy weights and stuff, uh, in addition to that, I 
Um, also did a lot of cardio, so I would do those Stairmasters, um, Jacob's Ladder, that was really brutal. I don't know if you know what that is. They like strap your waist in and then you have like this ladder that you're like climbing. Anyways, super intense and I loved it. I also did a lot of like high intensity kind of crossfit -y kind of workouts. Um, I was a swimmer um, and I also frequented the yoga and Pilates studio pretty regularly. So, oh, and then of course, like I'm a huge walker. I live in a really big city in Canada, so I don't drive anywhere. I barely take public transit. I just pretty much walk to everything. As long as it's like an hour and a half away, then uh, I'm definitely going to do the walk. So suffice it to say, I was a pretty active person and uh, moreover, I loved being an active person. Um, exercising for me, going to the gym, it wasn't a punishment. It wasn't anything like that. It, it brought me joy. Um, I love movement and also it was my form of stress relief. Um, that was really how I managed my stress during my PhD and working and doing a PhD at the same time and volunteering on a crisis line and all of that, you know, there's a lot of stress. So going to the gym really helped me manage that. However, um, as my LS was progressing, I was having more and more difficulty working out at the gym. Uh, well, not just the gym, but the yoga studio, anywhere. Um, and I, like, I didn't know what was going on then, but I realized now, that when I was exercising, I had a lot of like tears and fissures. And so when I would do, especially when I would do certain movements, I would like feel them. I would feel like I was ripping almost. And I would feel like the, where the fissures were, there was a lot of stinging and almost like, like stabbing pain. Um, the itch would drive me crazy. And of course I can't just like shove my hand down my pants in the middle of a freaking gym. Uh, and go to town scratching away. So I would just have to kind of like silently hold it in um, And it, it would get more and more frustrating as my symptoms got worse because Well, I mean, you know, there's the one part of it, which is being told that there's nothing wrong and yet everywhere I go I'm stinging and stabbing and itching and and pain and so that in itself is kind of hard to wrap your head around but the more I would do it, the more I would kind of like shy away from doing certain movements that I would have. And that kind of made me sad. And I, I talk about this in my blog, but I remember there was one time and I was at a, in a hot yoga class, which you can imagine a hot yoga class. That was a thing. Um, if you don't know what hot yoga is, uh, you're basically doing uh, yoga in a, in a heated room. The humidity is very high, so you sweat a lot. So you're in super tight spandex and you're sweating a lot everywhere. So maybe not the most uh, conducive place to do yoga for somebody like me, but again, I, I didn't know what I had. And uh, we were doing like a meditation at one point and I had my, my legs up on the walls so it's kind of like this here is my torso and these are my legs um and even just doing that like my legs up on the wall and i'm like closing my eyes i'm trying to concentrate and i just keep feeling this like stinging and stabbing and irritations and just ugh, going on down there and i'm you know we were doing a meditation and i remember feeling really really gutted um because i was like I don't know how much of this I can I can tolerate anymore and I don't know what I need to do but I think I might need to like stop exercising because I was just it was just making me miserable um, and shortly after I mean maybe shortly I don't know I have no concept of time let's say a few months later um, when I got my lichen sclerosis diagnosis um, it really put me through um, a big funk. Um, my mental health definitely took a huge hit during that time. Um, depression, anxiety, fear, body dysmorphia, health anxiety, you, you name it. I was just, uh, I cried every single day. And um, I also took a really extreme approach to things. So I wasn't very educated when I got my diagnosis. I wasn't really told what it was. I wasn't really told how to treat. I definitely got no information with respect to lifestyle and I had a lot of questions about lifestyle. I wanted to know, can I exercise? I wanted to know what sex looked like and what that meant for me. I wanted to know um, about clothing, about toilet paper, about, you know, so many things. Um, and without 
any real information um, and any guidance. I just kind of had to figure things out on my own. And I don't know, I think for me, um, I have struggled with anxiety ever since I like have memories. Um, and I think that one way that my anxiety kind of shows is um, I act and think in extremes. So when I was diagnosed, I basically stopped all exercise. I told myself that I wouldn't be able to exercise again. I told myself, you know, no more weightlifting, no more um, Pilates, no more yoga, no more, definitely no more HIIT. Um, everything was just kind of like off the table for me. Um, and I didn't just take it that far. I, I took it even further. Um, I didn't go for any more walks. Um, and I went to such an extreme where I tried to stop like basically moving. So like even, pardon me, even in my small apartment, I was really mindful. Like I would try to take the least amount of steps possible. So I would try to like drink less so that I would need to walk to the bathroom less. Like basically, you know, as sedentary as I could possibly make myself, that's what I was doing. And I know that a lot of that was motivated by anxiety and a lack of information and education, a lack of a support system. Um, and also this was, you know, of course, really driven by my anxiety. And, you know, again, that kind of manifests in these extreme behavioral um, patterns and these, these thought patterns. And so um, that was really hard on me, especially because that was my big stress relief. So when you took away, you know, the main thing that I used for stress reduction and stress management. And, and also, you know, one of the biggest things that brings me joy, movement, exercise, it was really, you know, that was really hard too. And I, th I definitely think that didn't make things easier when it came to like kind of coping and processing because we kind of stripped away all of those things that used to help me. Um, and so it, that, was pretty much my life for about nine months, um, the famous nine months where I had no answers and no resources and no one to really talk to until I met um, my gynecologist. And uh, when I met him, <laughs> poor guy, I, I basically, I mean, nine months is a long time. So in nine months, a brain like mine, like, who we can think of a lot of questions. And I had a lot of questions. I like, it was like scroll, you know, it was just like, question, question, question. And um, he was wonderful. He took his time and he went through every single question that I asked um, and he answered me. And so of course, one of those questions was, can I exercise with lichen sclerosis? And I also wanted to know like, are there certain activities or movements or workout programs that I like should avoid? And in the same vein, um, I've always been a swimmer ever since I was little. And so I wanted to know, like, can I still swim? Because I figured that swimming was absolutely off the table. I figured that regardless of if it was chlorine or salt water, I thought there's no way. Um, I thought that the salt or the chlorine would just irritate me and cause a flare. Um, and I was incredibly surprised by his answer because even though I asked the questions, I kind of figured that I already knew the answer and that the answer was no, or that, you know, maybe I could walk, but like I couldn't do any real activities that I used to. Uh, I definitely thought he was gonna tell me no to swimming. Um, and much to my surprise, um, it was a complete opposite. Um, he said that I can absolutely exercise. And in fact, he was like, I encourage you to exercise. It's very good for your health it's very good for stress relief and you really don't need to stop living um, completely or you know cut things out um, you just might need to make a few modifications but so at the end of the day the answer to can i exercise with lichen sclerosis i mean the short answer is yes absolutely you can exercise with lichen sclerosis but I'm going to talk about a couple caveats that come with that and things that you should be mindful of and consider um, if you want to be exercising or if you want to reincorporate um, exercise into your lifestyle. All right, so the short answer is yes, you can exercise, but now let's dig into those caveats a little. 
So the thing is, um, and everyone's going to be a bit different, and I'll get to that later, but to start, yes, you can exercise, but you might need to modify or change up a couple things um, with respect to how you exercise. So I'm going to run through a couple or like um, four or five um, and different types of exercises and things that you might want to consider. Um, there are way more, you know, exercise types and workouts to consider, but this is just to give you a general idea. Um, if there's something that I missed and that you're curious about, um, you can always leave me a comment and I will do my best to answer you or get you an answer. So let's start with swimming. So yes, um, my gynecologist told me absolutely you can swim. There's just a couple things you might want to kind of switch up. So first of all, um, chlorine is fine and so is salt water. Now if you're going to be swimming, his advice um, is to use some coconut oil before you go in the water. So, you know, you're getting changed in the bathroom, let's just say. Um, put some coconut oil or whatever kind of moisturizer you want, um, olive oil. You can use something thicker like a barrier cream like um, Aquaphor or Vaseline. So it'll have that nice thick layer to kind of protect the skin against uh, you know, the irritation, the irritatingness of the chlorine or the salt water. So we're kind of, you know, you just kind of put that all over the vulva. So your labia majora, labia minora, um, the clitoris, all of that, the vaginal opening, just basically the vulvar area. So you put that on, you put your bathing suit on, swim to your heart's desire, uh, whether that's laps or just kind of floating around on a floaty, you know, with maybe a margarita. I don't know. I don't drink, um, but anyways, you get my point. Um, once you're done swimming, it's strongly advised not to linger in your wet bathing suit. So, you know, as much as is possible, get out of it as soon as you can. Now, that doesn't mean you like get out of the water and like beeline to the bathroom, like, you know, but as, as soon as you can, it's advised to get out of your bathing suit. And then once you get out of your bathing suit, just rinse off with water, reapply some coconut oil or olive oil or V Magic or Rescue Balm or whatever it is that you use. Reapply that and that's pretty much it. If you happen to fall on a day that you apply your steroids, you just apply those later when you're ready and that's pretty much it. Um, I can tell you that ever since you gave me that advice, I have been swimming. I've swam in the ocean, I've swam in pools, I um, uh, my family recently rented, well, recently uh, in the fall, rented out a big chalet and they had this like massive, like 20 person hot tub spa thing. And, um, which was chlorinated, of course. And I went in there, no problems whatsoever. I did follow this protocol. I always follow this protocol when I am swimming. Um, and interestingly, when I asked him in the office, I was actually going to Cuba a couple weeks after so that was really I was I really had that on my mind and I followed his protocol in Cuba but even at that like I would go swimming in the in the ocean and then I didn't like immediately run out of the ocean back to our hotel or yeah our hotel let's say we'll call it back to our room and change like I would actually like go swimming a bit and then I would come out and tan on the chair and then when it got too hot, I would like go back in the water. And I'd do that quite a few times, basically until we got hungry and wanted to go eat. <laughs> that was what dictated when we were going to go and I was going to get changed was my appetite. So, you know, I, you know, again, I didn't stay in the wet bathing suit all day. Sometimes we'd go to the beach in the morning and then the pool in the afternoon. And I would definitely switch suits um, and I would reapply my coconut oil and all of that. But um, yeah, I had no problems and it didn't increase my flare at all. Uh, or it didn't cause me to flare, I should say, because at that point I was in remission. Um, so that's swimming, and that's, you know, the kind of swimming protocol that, that I follow. So another um, thing that you might want to do is cycling. A lot of people like to cycle on their bikes, um, and this is something I asked him about cycling. Um, I'm not really a big cycler, to be honest. I, I wish I was, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. Biking in the city just stresses me out. If I'm like camping, no, no worries. I'll cycle, but not in the city. 
And he basically said like, that's up to you, um, that the seats might bug you, especially if you're in a flare. But that again, you know, just be mindful and kind of feel where you're at. Um, one recommendation that I have is to consider switching your bike seat. So there are, um, and I will drop a couple recommendations in the comments below. And if you are a cyclist and you have a great recommendation for a bicycle seat or any kind of bicycle gear that can make cycling um, better and more comfortable, please share that information so that other people can learn and get back on the bike. Um, but what you might want to look for is seats with more cushion. There are also like wider seats. Um, bike seats tend to be pretty narrow. Uh, there are some that are wider and then have like a like a cutout space for um, your vulva so that there's not so much pressure on it. So if you want to cycle, something to consider is to um, <clears throat> get a different seat or you know get some equipment to kind of make things easier. Um, not equipment, but there are these like, they're called silly pads, I think. Again, I'm gonna put those in the comments, not in the description box, I'll put those in the comments. Um, uh, they're kind of like this, it's like a silicone insert that you kind of like lay over the vulva and it kind of acts as this protective cushion layer that kind of absorbs a lot of the, the, the impact. Um, so that can be less irritating for the vulva. Um, okay, let's talk about weightlifting, my favorite. <laughs> um, so, Again, with weightlifting, there are many different movements that you could be doing. You could be training legs, you could train your upper body, abs, etc. Um, and again, you know, mindfulness is key. Um, if you're in an active flare, you might want to back off of certain movements. But if a movement feels good for you and it's not irritating you, then by all means, go for it. Um, I know that when I was feeling really bad, what I tended to do was... I tended to stick to kind of upper body more um, and I kind of just let my legs have a little break. Um, this way there was like less friction, you know, if I was lunging or if I was squatting, I wasn't, you know, kind of spreading that area. Um, so I kind of just let that be and I really focused on like training my core and my back and my chest. Um, so that can be something to kind of do so that you can still get some weight or some resistance work while also not irritating things down there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about weights um, in a bit, but um, that's something to kind of consider when you're doing weightlifting. Um, yoga. Yoga is fantastic. I practice yoga almost daily um, and I have for a long time. With yoga, um, some poses you might find are really too much for you. Um, and that really depends on where your lichen sclerosis is, if you're in a flare, etc. So if you're in a flare or if you have active tears, or fissures, or any kind of open sore, you probably want to avoid like a big hip opener, like a happy baby or, you know, a kind of split kind of pose, anything where you're really opening up that area. You know, if you've got a tear, it could tear more and I've done that. I've had tears and I've been in the yoga studio and I've done like a big warrior two or something and then I've like felt it tear on me. And I'm like, oh boy, that sucks. Um, so in general then, the thing that I advise with yoga is of course, again, be mindful of your body, but what they will often tell you, what most yoga teachers will tell you is that if a pose doesn't feel right for your body, sit it out or do a different pose. So if, for example, um, they're doing a happy baby, then I might just lie in Shavasana and wait until they move into a sequence or a, se or a pose that I can hold without, you know, aggravating my LS more. Um, and, you know, this holds for, for anything. If you have a knee injury, um, my knees aren't the greatest, and so there are certain poses that really aggravate them. And when I do that, I will either modify the pose or I'll do a completely different pose. Or if I'm feeling really tired, I'll just kind of lie down for a little bit and focus on my breathing and rejoin when I feel ready to. So these are just kind of four examples of, you know, ways that you might need to kind of modify things. 
Um, everyone's different, everybody's body is different, so how you modify things will look slightly different from other people. But I think the point that I really want to drive home here is that, you know, it's not about like stopping all exercise ever, but it's more about finding a way that you can still exercise and move your bodies in ways that bring you joy, but that are also safe for your body and for your life and sclerosis. So the second point that I want to emphasize is that you don't have to be like me and live in a world of extremes, right? So you can still exercise, you just might need to make some modifications. But conversely, you also don't want to overdo it. You don't want to over-exercise or overexert yourself and then cause your body harm. So, you know, um, an example of that might be if I was doing yoga and they asked me to do a happy baby and I had a bunch of tears and I did it anyway and I felt myself tear more and then I went into another big hip opener um, just to kind of push through um, but really I'm not doing my body any you know any good here um, so again you don't need to completely cut it out but you also don't want to ignore your body and push through you know that kind of pain um, you want to really try and find that in between that kind of sweet spot um, and so the third thing to kind of uh, note here is mindfulness 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 i know it's a big buzzword we hear it everywhere but i can tell you as someone that's been practicing it for such uh such a long time maybe not that long um a couple years now it really makes such a difference um, so again the key is to really kind of tune into your body and listen to it and listening to your body is how you respect your body it's how you show love to your body and care and compassion so again mindfully move through your workouts right notice hmm does this feel good does this feel bad does this feel neutral? Like maybe it's fine. It doesn't particularly feel great, but I'm also not in any pain or discomfort, so I will continue. Or this feels amazing. I'm gonna stay in this pose longer. So just as I was saying, if there's a pose in yoga that you, you know, is causing pain, um, you can kind of sit that out and do another pose. Well, also if there's a pose that feels freaking phenomenal in your body, stay in it longer right? The, the teachers are there to just kind of guide you through, but the practice is yours. You decide what you're going to do and how you're going to move through that practice. So if something, you know, is really feeling amazing, stay there. Absolutely. By all means, trust me, no yoga teacher will be upset about that. And speaking of yoga, I do want to give a shout out to Wellbeing by Penny. That's wellbeing.by.penny on Instagram. I will leave her information in the description box below. She is an incredible LS warrior. She has LS herself and she's a yoga teacher and she has a whole practice online. Um, you know, she's a, a teacher, a coach, and she has these amazing yoga practices. And her yoga is all about yoga for pelvic pain. That includes lichen sclerosis or any other kind of pelvic floor issues that you might have. So if you have hypertonic pelvic floor, if you have um, really bad menstrual cramps, or endometriosis, any kind of, you know, vulvodynia, vaginismus, anything like that, this is all phenomenal for that and I've you know had the honor and pleasure of being in her class um, and she's amazing she teaches you mindfulness she teaches you how to breathe how to move how to respect your body and it's just there are some amazing yoga teachers out there but it's so nice to have someone that is kind of um, creating a yoga practice around you know, our issues, which is our kind of pelvic floor, vagina, the vulva, right? We're kind of focusing on that. And she really focuses on bringing breath and attention to that space, opening up in ways that kind of reduce tension and pain, which is something you absolutely want if you have lichen sclerosis. So I think that's a really nice way to kind of meld 
that mindfulness and also practice moving mindfully um, at the same time. And it's nice to do this with someone that has LS and can, you know, kind of cue certain things there. So another question that I get asked um, and that people commonly have is, okay, so cool. So I can exercise with lichen sclerosis. Awesome. Can I exercise if I have a flare? So this one is a little bit different. Um, if you have an active flare, I might recommend backing off of exercise for a little bit until you get that flare to kind of come down and kind of return to your baseline. So again, backing off, kind of vague, and it's kind of gonna have different meanings depending on you, your body, and what a flare entails for you, right? Like, is it itching or are there tears? What's going on? But I think, you know, for me, backing off with a flare would be either kind of full stop, no exercise. Mine is like walking and stuff, but like I wouldn't probably go lift weights or go do, you know, a run or do a CrossFit workout when I was in an active flare. I'd probably just put that aside and take a little break. Now, instead, what I might suggest in place, if you're really kind of craving some movement, but you do want to respect your body and give your body time to kind of settle the flare, then you could maybe practice working with like really gentle movement. And one thing that I would highly recommend for this is doing a restorative yoga practice. Um, restorative yoga is extremely gentle and it is very slow paced so you're not moving quickly through a series you're staying in one pose sometimes for like five plus minutes it's very relaxing um, personally I like to do a restorative yoga practice at least once a week because I find it very rejuvenating and grounding and is also just really relaxing I like doing it at the end of the day as a way to kind of settle things and get ready for bed um, but again because you're staying in kind of like one extended pose for like a nice chunk of time you're really able to move very slowly very gently and when you move slowly and gently you are you have a better ability to kind of cue into your body and see what it's saying to you like nope this pose doesn't feel good okay we'll move so you know you can do some gentle yoga, some restorative yoga. Um, you can, you know, maybe explore with like upper body movement. And so uh, what I'm going to do, um, I won't do this at the gym. What I'm thinking I'm going to do is I'm going to film a couple videos of how to work out your upper body when you have, uh, when you're in an LS flare, or even if it's not in a flare, but it's just, you just don't feel good enough to do anything really intense with your legs. Um, now, not just because of COVID, but my gym is really like, they don't like cameras. So I'm probably going to film like a couple at home workouts. Um, so a couple things um, that will include bands, um, weights or nothing that you can do at your home that I'm going to do a standing series and a sitting series because I know um, sitting isn't okay for everyone. So I'm going to do some, like one series standing and another series sitting, um, all focusing on upper body. So we're really not moving, you know, below the waist so that can kind of stay stable. So look out for those if you are interested and in getting kind of ideas and what you can do uh, if you need to kind of give that lower body a break, but you are craving some movement. So that's what I would say with respect to a flare, I would Personally, probably just back off a little for a bit until it gets under control. But again, you know your body, be mindful, be gentle, and show it love. All right, so now I wanna give y'all some tips and tricks for exercising with LS and um, for reincorporating exercise or movement into your lifestyle after you've taken a break. Now, this list is meant kind of as like a general guideline. Um, so, you know, use this as you see fit. Um, some things might resonate with you, some things may not. That's totally okay. This is really based on my lived experience. Um, this is an evidence-based. They don't really have a lot of evidence-based research 
around lifestyle and lichen sclerosis. So I'm basing this off my lived experience and what worked for me. Please take what resonates with you and leave what doesn't resonate with you at the door. I'm not offended. Um, that is okay. You do what works for you. And of course, if you have questions, you can leave them in the comments or you can reach out to me and I will do my best to help you. So my first tip is to write down your goals, your goal or your goals. So let's say my goal is um, I want to weightlift again. Okay. Or I want to be able to go swimming or I want to go swimming two to three times a week. Whatever your goal is, whatever kind of exercise you want to get back into, write that down. If you know how frequently you would like to do it, like I want to go to the gym three times a week, write that down. You can be as specific or as general as you need to be. Of course, if you have the specifics, put them down. The second is acknowledge where you are. So, and this is going to be the physical aspect. So ask yourself, where am I physically? Am I in remission? Am I in a flare? Am I newly diagnosed? Is my skin, you know, raw and red or is it super itchy? Do I have any open sores? Because these are all going to kind of impact, you know, your plan of attack. So write down where you're at physically. And then thirdly, write down how you are feeling mentally. Check in with yourself and be really honest. Are you feeling anxious about this? Are you feeling angry? Are you feeling angry that you even have to write this list in the first place? That you even have to put this much thought and energy into, you know, being able to do something like exercise? Um, because that's a really real and very valid feeling. It's definitely something I felt, especially earlier on in my journey. Uh, I do have a blog post on anger and how to cope with anger and LS. So if you're interested in that, check out uh, that link in the description box below for that blog post. But yeah, so just be really real with yourself. Um, maybe you're kind of excited. Maybe you found out that you can do exercise again and you're feeling really hopeful. Maybe it's a mix. So write down, you know, I'm feeling really hopeful, but I'm also really scared and I don't know how this is going to work out. Write that down. Again, you want to be as detailed and as honest as possible. And then four is you want to put the pieces together. So look at your goal again, and then with that goal in mind, take into consideration where you are physically and where you are mentally, and then plan accordingly. Okay, so that's my little kind of tips and tricks checklist, but now I'm gonna walk you through, you know, what that would look like in practice, because I'm aware that this, without an example to kind of illustrate, this is kind of a little bit vague. Like I just said, put the pieces together. Like, great, Jacqueline, thanks. Um, so I'm going to kind of illustrate this, you know, with a couple examples to kind of give you a better idea as to how to kind of do that fourth step, how to put those pieces together in such a way that you can start working towards that goal. All right, so I'm going to kind of draw in my own experience and what I kind of went through when I started to reincorporate exercise into my life in order to give you an example to kind of help you know, understand what I mean with that little checklist and that fourth step of putting all the pieces together. So when I found out I could exercise again, um, my goal, I, I had a few goals, but we're just for the sake of, you know, this video, I'll keep it, you know, kind of brief and simple. So my goal was to get back into weightlifting and to take daily walks again, because prior to this, I would always walk every day, maybe not a big walk, but at least a 30 minute walk most days. Um, so those were my goals. So the second step is acknowledge where you're at physically. So at this point, I was almost in remission. You know, I think I was about like 85, 90% of the way there. I was feeling a lot better. I didn't have any more active fissures or tears or anything like that. I, I mostly just had kind of like minor irritation, the occasional stinging and burning, um, it's kind of like all my symptoms, but they were just like someone turned the volume down and it wasn't muted, but it was like almost muted. Um, so that was where I was at physically. Um, mentally, I was feeling really, really scared. Um, I was very anxious. I had a lot of fears, a lot of worries and concerns. 
Um, some of those were like, if I exercise, is this just gonna cause me to go into a flare? If I weight lift and start doing like lunges, am I gonna tear? Um, so a lot of like worries about the implication of movement for my body and for my health. So when it came to putting the pieces together, I looked at my goals. Okay, I wanna walk and I wanna do weightlifting. Now, um, when I looked at myself physically, uh, I was feeling like 85 to 90% better. So I didn't have, I was not in an active flare. Now, because I wasn't in an active flare, this told me that, okay, I'm ready to start reincorporating movement because if I was writing these goals down and I was in like a huge flare, I probably would, you know, opt for a restorative yoga, some really gentle movement and stretching instead of, you know, a plan to start back with weights and walking. So that's what I mean, like your physical, where you are physically is going to kind of determine what your plan of attack looked like. So because I was okay physically or doing pretty well physically, I was like, okay, I think we can start making some steps to bring this back. Now, when we look mentally at where I was, this is really gonna now impact my plan of attack because mentally I was very, very anxious and very scared. And because of my anxiety, I tend to be someone that likes doing things slowly. I like, you know, if my goal is here, I am like, I'm not the person that's gonna do it in two shots. I'm gonna take baby steps very, very slowly inching my way towards my goal. Um, and so that's what I did. So I'm gonna kind of break this down with weights and then walking. So let's start with the walking. So because I was anxious, I took that into consideration when I made my plan and I told myself, okay, for the first week, you're gonna walk about 10 minutes. So I had a, a certain parameter that I knew around my building or my neighborhood, I should say, that I was gonna walk. And I told myself, I'm gonna just do that, like about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, and I am going to walk that and see how that goes. Before I would leave the house, of course, I would put a lot of um, uh, coconut oil to make sure that everything was nice and lubricated down there to avoid a lot of the friction that can sometimes cause irritations. Um, and I would do those walks. So those walks weren't particularly long, at least they weren't for me, right? Prior to this, I was walking about an hour or two a day. Not always in one shot, but just I walk everywhere, so it adds up. So I started very slow. Instead of just going for a nice big walk, I walked really, really slowly. I put a lot of um, coconut oil. I wasn't like speed walking. I really kept like a slow, steady, mindful pace. And then after, you know, the first week or so, I would increase the walk from say 15 minutes to 20 or 25. And I basically like gradually built myself back up to you know being able to take longer walks um, and I acknowledge that a lot of this was really mental on my part um, there was a lot of like uh, you know I'm a very cerebral person I kind of live in my head and you know there's a lot of worries so I think really taking those slow baby steps to walking really helped me become more in touch with my body it helped calm some of those nerves right like with each time I walked my confidence would build a little now, I should say, and I, you know, I have a blog post on, you know, the fact that progress isn't linear. Um, and so, you know, I would be lying if I said that I just like built my way back up. Like there were some days where like I would walk and there would be some stinging and irritation. I'd feel really discouraged and really frustrated. And I'd go home thinking, oh no, it's a flare. What? Oh, I just, I can't do anything right. You know, I'd beat myself up over it. So there were some days where there were like some setbacks and I would just try as much as possible to accept it as what it was for that day. That day doesn't dictate the rest of my life and maybe I would take the next day off depending on how I felt and then I would just slowly kind of work back back to it. With weightlifting, I did something similar. Um, I, again, I started first just doing upper body. So I would go in and I would train, you know, my back, um, biceps, and then I would do a chest and tricep day. That's not my triceps, but um, tricep day. Uh, and then I would do like a, a kind of core day. Um, and I just did that for a little while because I just mentally didn't feel ready to incorporate kind of light movement. 
But after a while, you know, especially I was walking at the same time as I was getting more comfortable walking and getting more in touch with my body, I started feeling a little bit more confident. So when I felt ready, I would slowly try to do some leg stuff again. And I started doing leg stuff that um, didn't necessarily involve like uh, opening of that area. So I didn't initially do like squats or like sumo deadlifts. Instead, I tried doing things that kind of kept my legs kind of together. So I would do like a stiff leg deadlift. I would do um, hip thrusts. I would go on the machines where you do kind of those leg extensions um, and stuff like that. Uh, so there's this machine, the famous machine at the gym where you like put your legs in. It's for your adductors um, and you're kind of like opening your legs like this and everyone kind of laughs when you do it. Everyone feels awkward when they do it, but you eventually just shake that off. But anyway, suffice it to say that I didn't start back by doing the adductors because that splitting, that kind of real opening of the legs might have caused me some irritation. So I didn't jump back into it that way. I really did these like deliberate, thoughtful, gradual, building my way back up to it until I felt confident and safe and okay to kind of work my legs again. Um, so that was kind of my, my process. Um, I also journaled a lot throughout, um, you know, this process. So I would kind of journal, to, I, I would say like, you know, I walked 20 minutes and I felt a bit of stinging or today I walked 25 minutes and I didn't feel any stinging. Um, I did some squats and it was okay. And I would kind of like, you know, I would document both the physical and mental aspects of this so that I kind of had a record so that I could kind of see that overall progression since progress very rarely is a clean line up. It's often very rocky. And when it's rocky, sometimes we tend to just fixate and focus on those slumps um, and we don't we kind of miss that overall picture of progress. Um, so I found journaling uh, through that process very helpful as well. And it also gave me a lot of good feedback in terms of like, okay, you've been doing really well for a while. I think it's time that you can try something new or try this. So that was some, kind of my process. And that's kind of, you know, the, how you put the pieces together is you create a plan of attack to get to that goal, but to get to that goal in a way that kind of honors and respects where you are physically and where you are mentally. And of course, you know, um, bringing in some of those modifications, making sure you do put moisturizer on before some workouts, making sure you do, you know, change out of those tight spandex if that's what you choose to wear, or maybe you choose to wear looser um, fitting workout clothes, which is actually what I did. Um, in, in the beginning, I, I kind of got rid of all of my leggings and I kind of went for these like baggier shorts or just looser, like they weren't like basketball shorts, but you know, looser shorts, looser pants, uh, no more thongs, I cotton underwear, and I would change a shower and change. So, you know, you make those slight modifications and you kind of put your plan of action in a way that honors your body and your mental health and yeah, if you do all of that and you're mindful of whether you're in a flare or not, then you can absolutely exercise. So that's it for this video. If you learned something new or you found something helpful, or if you have suggestions for other people, things that um, you've learned with your journey in lichen sclerosis and exercise, things you want to do, things you are having trouble doing, uh, product recommendations, anything like that, drop them in the comments and um, hit that like button. And if you feel so inclined, I'd also super appreciate a subscribe. All right, that's it for this one. I will catch you in the next one. Bye.